see you here this evening. Make this on a little bit louder, would you, Dean? And uh, good to see you here tonight. We gave the choir the night off because we have uh, another singing group in town. Amen. And uh, looking forward to hearing the young ladies tonight. But let's all start by singing together. Turning your songbook over to 216, would you please? 216, Dwelling in Beulah Land. We're going to stand and sing. Brother Bob will lead us. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. First all together, far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sin that should be said on every hand. Down to fear and pain, the hand in vain to be our calling. None of these shall night and uh boy i got to think when i was standing up here i've been singing that song for over 50 years i know there's a gasp you can't believe i'm that old but um and i and it, you know what i'm still not tired of it amen and uh what a joy to to sing dwelling in beulah land well that's where you are tonight uh you're going to be in beulah land this evening great to see everybody here this evening thanks for coming back on sunday night and uh we have the tour group here from commonwealth Baptist College in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, the Clays Mill Road Baptist Church with Pastor Fugit and uh, Brother Fisher is the preacher you're going to hear this evening, and uh, it's going to be a great night together. We're going to pray, and then the girls are going to come and sing their first package for us. All right, let's bow together, shall we? Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, and thank you for a wonderful morning this morning for decisions that were made for thee. And now, Lord, we bow before you at the beginning of our service here tonight. We pray, God, that your hand of blessing will be upon these young ladies as they minister to us in song. Lord, I pray that you'll be pleased and you'll be glorified with what's said and done in this place this evening. Lord, work in our hearts the best we know how we yield to you. I pray that you'll have your will and way in each one of our lives. Use the music, use the preaching of your word this evening to accomplish your will in each of our lives. And I pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I 
I found happiness. I found peace of mind. I found the joy of living perfect. Love sublime. I found real contentment. Happy living in accord. I found happiness all the time. Wonderful peace of mind when I found the Lord. From Commonwealth Baptist College, we are the voices of praise. No more lonely days of pain and misery. For the door of happiness, I found the key. I have found a life of love and harmony. Wondrous happiness all the time, harmony so divine since I found the Lord. Hello everyone, my name is Denise Padilla. I'm from Hammond, Indiana, and I will be a senior in the fall studying elementary education. Hi, my name is Amber Young. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky, and I'll be a sophomore this fall studying secondary education. Hello, my name is Danielle Winkley. I'm from Moreland, Georgia, studying secondary education as a senior this fall. And at the piano, we have Lauren Claney from Georgetown, Kentucky, who will be a sophomore this fall studying music education. I'm so happy with this brand new melody. I found that I can be a glorious sea of symphony. Looking forward to that happy true jubilee. Glorious symphony all the time. Melody so divine since I found the Lord. I found happiness. I found peace of mind. I found the joy of living perfect. Love sublime, I found real contentment, happy living in accord. I found happiness all the time, wonderful peace of mind when I found the Lord. I found happiness all the time, wonderful peace of mind when I found the Lord. song that I could sing you, one more story I could tell before I leave. If I only had one message I could bring you, there's no question it would be about the cross, about the blood, about the place I found, God's mercy and love. And although it's bittersweet, remembering the cost, there's something beautiful about the cross. could sing about the state of grace I live in and the peace and joy I have when times are tough and to see all the blessings I've been given in the end my life is just my life is just about the cross about the cross, about the blood, about the blood, about the place I found, God's mercy and love. And although it's bittersweet, remembering the cost, there's something beautiful about the cross. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown There's something beautiful
463. Would you turn with me in your hymnal? When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. 463. We're going to sing that first and last together. On that first. Oh, and the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the sin of us shall gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder. Is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up Now some announcements. Listen carefully if you would. Uh, schedule this week. Uh, my wife and I are going to leave on vacation in the morning. And, uh, but you're going to get a treat Wednesday night. You get to hear Brother Jack Jarvis here Wednesday evening. And so you look forward to that Wednesday night for the midweek service. Next Sunday you'll get to hear Brother Moreland. Uh, he'll be here and he'll be speaking for you and you'll get to hear kind of update on what happened in Armenia and what was going on there and uh, some exciting things uh, that deal with some of those uh, close countries that uh, it's exciting what God's doing and so you're going to have a great time uh, listening to those men while we're gone and that'll be a good time now tonight right after the service uh, we've got ice cream over in the fellowship hall and but we don't just have ice cream you've got you got let's see chocolate syrup strawberry syrup is it caramel or caramel uh, yep we got that and uh However you say it, and you got nuts, and you got strawberries, and you got bananas, and chocolate chips, and let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. And uh, <laughs> you're okay. He said, "I'm in." You know. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have a great time. So don't uh, don't wander off. Uh, come on over, and get a chance to be there with us, and uh, get a chance to fellowship with the folks from the college. They'll enjoy that. We'll enjoy getting to meet them and know them a little bit. And uh, just plan to hang around and enjoy it tonight, okay? And uh, we'll have a great time right after the service this evening, okay? All right. Let's take just a moment. <clears throat> Welcome any visitors we have with us tonight. Always glad when folks visit with us in the service. And uh, if you're visiting tonight and not a member here at Bible Baptist Church, love to meet you and find out who you are and where you're from. And uh, Chris Jewell, good to see you tonight, brother. Man, that's great, man. You have somebody with you. Who do you have with you? Kristen. Kristen? Good. Kristen, thanks for coming tonight. Good to have you. That's wonderful. All right. Dutch was going to hand you a card there to fill out. In a little bit, you just, uh, when the offering goes by, <clears throat> Kristen, if you'd be kind enough, just put that card in the plate and uh, keep the pen as our gift to you for coming. We're delighted you're here this evening. And uh, anyone else tonight looking to see? Good to see the Cato's here this evening. And I think that's Todd, isn't it? And uh, yeah, I got it right this time, huh? All right. Okay. All right. Let's give this young lady a warm welcome, shall we? <clears throat> All right. We have an anniversary to celebrate. And uh, Brett and Lisa Lindke. And I uh, thought you'd get out of this because you were gone on the Sunday after anniversary. But we, we held on to We didn't keep the flowers for a week. We actually got those fresh, okay? And uh, we want to honor their anniversary. And uh, we appreciate Brett and Lisa and the work they do here. And Lisa Piano, Brett and the bus route. And uh, they're doing a wonderful job. We're so thankful for them. Anniversary number... Four. All right. Four years. How about that? Man, that went by fast, didn't it? And uh, we got a card for you, Brother Brett. Thank you. Thank you. And we want to sing happy anniversary. All right. <laughs>
Oh, I didn't have to say kiss your bride, did I? He was going for it, huh? It's what you call planting one on her is what you call that, amen? I, I'm so pleased that though you're from New York and you spent time in Kentucky, you have your Ohio State necktie on tonight. That's good. He's, he's an official convert, and uh, praise God for that, all right? Ladies, come back and sing again for us, would you please? That's great. You place your head on his Bible when you swear to tell the truth. His name is on our greatest monuments, on our money too. When we pledge allegiance, there's no doubt where we stand. There's no separation, we're one nation under Him. In God we still trust, here in America, He's the one we turn to every time the going gets rough. He is the source of all our strength, the one who watches over us, here in America. God we still trust now there are those among us who want to push him out and erase his name from everything this country's all about from the schoolhouse to the courthouse they're silencing his word now it's time for all believers to make our voices heard. In God we still trust, here in America, He's the one we turn to every time the going gets rough. He is the source of all our strength, the one who watches over us, here in America. In God we still trust, America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood, from sea to shining sea, here in America. In God we still trust, America. Show her God's love. No mother or father to wipe away her tears. She cries out in the night alone. Bury my heart on the mission field, Lord. I'll go to dry that young girl's tears. I'll serve you no matter may lead. Lord, please bury my heart. A mother grieves for a starving child. She has no shelter from the cold. Earthly provisions will ease her suffering, but who will feed their empty souls. Bury my heart on the mission field, Lord. I'll give the gospel to the suffering world. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Lord, please bury my heart. Will you ignore these lost souls in the night? 
you hear their pleading cries they're begging for someone to show them the way we must go before another one dies bury my eyes on the mission field Lord. these distant voices won't fade away i'll do your way Lord, please bury my heart. Lord, I'll give you my heart. Amen. That was great. Would you turn with me to number 298 in your hymnal? 298. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. 298, when you find that, would you stand with me? On that first all together. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. Great one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. chorus with me now. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Joy 
It floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me. Sing that last with me. When we get to the chorus, we're going to have the instruments drop, drop out. We're going to sing that a cappella. On that last, joy floods my soul, for Jesus. singing you can be seated brother fisher i always years ago that song got ruined for me by tom malone you know that story he said he always had that fellow in his church that always sang that verse not for the years of tom malone but for eternity and old tom malone said i'm thankful to god that it's not for the years of tom malone but for all eternity amen and uh that's a great blessing Tom Malone, great preacher, great preacher. In heaven now with the Lord, but a great preacher. And uh, a lot of good good men. Pray for, uh, as we said this morning, pray for Dr. Dr. Clarence Sexton. Uh, he, as far as I know, still is in critical condition and uh, hospital there after some heart, open heart surgery. So please pray for him tonight. And uh, uh, Bobby Robertson, uh, his wife went to heaven. Uh, yeah, well, the viewing was yesterday. The service is tonight at 5 o'clock, I believe it was. And uh, pray for him. 66 years of uh, being together, serving the Lord together. And uh, so pray for him and pray for the church there. Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walkertown, North Carolina. Great church down there. All right. Let's pray for offering tonight. Brother Andy, lead us in our prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight, we just are reminded of how blessed we are to call you our, our Heavenly Father and our Savior, how much you've loved us and given your Son to die for us, so that we could have eternal life. Lord, we, we come before you um, with these requests tonight. We pray for Dr. Sexton tonight, what a man of God, and what a man who's served his generation by the will of God. We just pray that you be with him and as he heals from the surgery that you would put your healing hand upon him father also be with brother robertson tonight with the loss of his wife and comfort him and may your grace be upon him lord just bless this offering now bless each gift and giver alike and uh, we'll thank you for it bless the preaching to come open our hearts and to your word and may we be receiving of the word tonight that it would come in and do its work in our lives lord and we'll thank you for it in jesus name amen are going to come and sing one more song for us and Brother Fisher is going to come and preach 
uh, for this evening. Brother Fisher, how long have you been at Commonwealth? Uh, one month. I thought, uh, no. One month. I passed it for 13 years. Yeah. I just started in June. Was it June? Okay. I knew you were new. I didn't know you were that new. And uh, <laughs> so you came, uh, came in and they sent you on the road, huh? Then, then they're going to keep you, huh? All right. We'll look forward to hearing him preach for us this evening and uh, what the Lord's given him to give to us. But girls, you come, you sing for us, and Brother Fisher, you come preach. Beside the gate of heaven, waiting to go in. And he wondered how this holy place could take a man like him. With shouts of great rejoicing, and with music then they came. Of the angels standing by him, he asked what could be their name. What could be their name? These are the company of prophets, the goodly fellowship of souls, who spake God's word with faith and boldness, who blessed the poor and made the wounded whole. Oh, he fell upon his knees and cried, I am not one of these. He waited till another band of shining ones drew nigh. They entered into heaven with a hallelujah cry. He asked again, who are these? Can you tell me whence they came? He seemed to see the answer in a burning tongue of flame burning tongue of flame. These are the company of martyrs, the mighty fellowship of saints, who knew our Lord and walked beside Him, who ran the holy race and did not faint. Oh, He fell upon His knees cried, I am not one of these. Then suddenly a multitude was heard from far away. Their voices rang with songs of joy like children at their play. He saw Rahab, he saw David, Mary Magdalene and Paul. And the thief who died by Jesus was the one who led them all. One who led them all. Who are these? He almost shouted at the angel. These are the sinners saved by grace. The host of them who called upon the Savior. Washed in blood and justified by faith. And oh, he leaped up from his knees. from sin. I've been washed in the blood, everlasting life to win. I can rejoice, I can lift up my voice, I can sing, and I can go in. Praise God, I can go I like singing. I hear a song like that because I can go in. I'm a bus kid. I'm a bus kid, and so uh, I'm not a martyr. I'm not a prophet. I'm a bus kid, but I sure am glad that two Tennessee Temple students came by my home in Brunswick, Ohio, took time out of their Saturday.
to share the good news of Jesus Christ and invite me to ride a bus. And as a result of that, I trusted Christ as Savior. My older brother, my older sister, they trusted Christ as Savior. And my youngest sister trusted Christ as Savior, all because of bus workers coming by our home on a Saturday. Boy, I tell you what, I sure am glad for the grace of God, I tell you. I'm not uh, one of those heavy, talented guys. I'm just a public school graduate who was a bus kid, but uh, somebody took time to invest in my life, and only as God could orchestrate that after pastoring now, I would become vice president of Commonwealth Baptist College. What better place for a bus kid to serve at a college than at Commonwealth Baptist College where a preacher is still excited about preaching He's still excited about Sunday school, and he's still excited about running the buses up and down the country. And so what a blessing. As I said, I served for the last 13 years as pastor in western Pennsylvania, and as only God can mess up your plans in your life, I tell you, he did mine. Uh, we just purchased a home just a couple of years ago when my mother passed away. Um, we moved my dad in so he could live with us, so there would be stability in his life, no change. And uh, only as God can do, after we get him settled in, I had Pastor Fugit in for a tent revival, and that just got the ball rolling. And I'll tell you, he just messed everything up from there. And so, as I said, uh, I stepped down uh, from the church that I served for 13 years, to come on staff at Commonwealth Baptist College. I'm so excited about Commonwealth Baptist College. I'll tell you what, there is a just a heart for revival. There is a heart for church planning at Commonwealth Baptist College, and I don't know of any better person to learn from than Pastor Fugit. I tell you, before we moved and while we were in the process of moving, my youngest daughter was care flighted two times. We thought we'd lose her during that whole process. You know, it's amazing how the Lord works. For 13 years, I never had a pastor that I could call on during times of crises. But as only God can orchestrate during that time when my daughter was in the trauma unit there at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, I had a pastor for the first time. 13 years, and that's Pastor Fugit. And as we were there for uh, uh, all night, uh, I don't know how many times I got texts and phone calls from Pastor Fugit during that time. And so uh, I want to encourage you, if you want to study and you're interested in the ministry, I don't know of a better place. I've been told that there are other Bible colleges out there. I know of none, all right? I only know of common, I'm just kidding, they pay me to say that, and as long as they pay me, I'm going to say that, uh, but uh, I tell you, Commonwealth Baptist College is a college you can trust, and I, I say this tenderly, and I hope uh, respectfully at the same time when I say this, our pastor, Pastor Fugit, is not an innovator, he's an imitator, by that I mean he has sat at the feet of the giants of the faith, and he's committed to the historic fundamentals of the faith. He's walked with the giants, and he's committed to walking down the old paths. And so whenever your loved one, when your family member comes to Commonwealth Baptist College, you won't have to worry about our pastor recommending uh, a book written by a leader in the emergent church movement. That's not Commonwealth Baptist College. But if you're interested in old-time fundamentalism, I hope that you will stop by, stop by our display, pick up some information about Commonwealth Baptist College in Lexington, Kentucky, a ministry of the Great Clays Mill Road Baptist Church. If you would also do our ladies a huge favor, and that is, will you buy their music CDs that are back there? I say you would be a help to the girls because they have to load that stuff in and out as we travel. And so the more you buy, the lighter the load, all right? Isn't that sweet of me to think of the girls like that? Hope that you will. I tell everyone our music CDs are priced like you're shopping at Walmart, not at Target, all right? 
So they start out one for 10, and as you buy more, they get cheaper, all right? And I say they get cheaper because we really do want you to pay for the CDs when you pick them up, all right? Hey, thank you. Thank you for opening. I'm glad you're laughing. Yeah, you got that. All right. You, you know, as slow as you respond to my jokes, you could actually sing in our group. That's the way they respond. All right. Well, I tell you, now that I've offended everyone, all right, uh, and erase that off of the tape, if you would, there. Well, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do this evening, would you turn to 1 Kings chapter 17? 1 Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. I propose to you this evening that the man of God is not your enemy. The man of God has been sent into your life to show you who God is and what God wants to do in your life. First Kings 17, you understand that the the book of 1 Kings is actually a continuation of 2 Samuel. And although the writer is unknown, maybe Jeremiah, we always know whenever it comes to the scriptures, the author is God. 1 Kings opens with the death of David, and it closes with the death of Jehoshaphat. In chapters 1 through 11, under Solomon, the kingdom is united. In chapters 12 through 22, after Solomon's death, the kingdom is divided. Someone has summarized the history of Israel this way. Israel floundered under the judges. She flourished under David and Solomon, and she fragmented under Rehoboam. Allow me to read aloud as you're seated there. 1 Kings 17, beginning at verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Give thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And... As she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not. Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? 
Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, carried him up into a loft where he abode, and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried unto the Lord, and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child, and brought him down out of the chamber into the house, and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Chapter 17 introduces us to the Old Testament prophet Elijah. Elijah's name means Jehovah is God. How interesting, isn't it, that his parents would make such a statement by naming their son Elijah in a day of apostasy and Baal worship. Chapter 19 reveals his humanity. Chapter 18 reveals his heroism. And here in chapter number 17, it reveals his humility. In chapter 17, there is the dry brook in verses 2 through 7. There is the depleted barrel in verses 8 through 16. And then there is the dead body in verses 17 through 24. The dry brook was Elijah's test. The dead body proves to be the widow's test. Now, Elijah is one of those characters in the Bible. Elijah saw things as only right or wrong. It was either Jehovah or Baal. There was no middle ground whenever it came to the prophet Elijah. There was no toleration of evil. Here is a man led by the Spirit of God, and Elijah is always confronting people about their sin. Elijah is a prophet that confronted kings in their palaces, not only there, but also he is the one who will confront the crowds at Mount Carmel. Now this drought that we read about here in chapter 17 that came upon the land of Israel, it was the result or it was because of Baal worship. In verse 8, God tells Elijah to travel about 100 miles from Cherith to the town of Zarephath. It is here, according to verse number 12, that Elijah encounters this widow as she is preparing what little food she has and what she believes to be her last meal before dying. Isn't that the way that life sometimes works? Whenever you're struggling to make ends meet, company stops in and you have to host them. Here we have a widow who is preparing what she believes to be her last meal when God sends the man of God her way. I think you and I, we can grasp the gravity of the situation when God sends Elijah into this widow's life. Could you, the best that we can tonight, put yourself in this widow's shoes, please, as we go back and as we look at these verses. Look with me, if you would, as your Bible's open, that last half of verse number 10. And he called to her and said... Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water and a vessel that I may drink. So he comes onto the scene. He's never met this widow before. And he said, if you do me a favor, I'd like for you to get me a cup of water to drink. Now, if you would, look at verse number 11. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Get me something to drink. 
And as you're getting me something to drink, I want you to get me something to eat also. Look, if you would, at verse 13. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Preacher comes to town, says to this widow lady who thinks she's fixing her last meal, get me something to drink. And while you're at it, get me something to eat. And before you eat or drink, make sure that I get to eat and drink. This is what is happening here. Now notice the widow's response to the man of God, Elijah, in verse 18. And she said unto Elijah, what have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Elijah is sent by God into this widow's life, and upon his arrival, the man of God is telling her what to do and telling her to give what little she has to him. She's lost her husband, her and her son are about starving to death, and now her son dies. And she concludes that the man of God has come not only to tell her what to do, to give the man of God what little she has, but she believes all the man of God wants to do is just point out everything she's ever done wrong in her life. And if we're not careful, you and I can understand why the man of God has been sent into our lives. If we're not careful, we might even become critical of the man of God and misunderstand the role and responsibility of the man of God. And because of the abuse of some, people have taken an adversarial position toward the man of God. Look with me, if you would, at verse 18, would you please? And she said unto Elijah, what have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Notice the expression there, man of God. Look, if you would, at verse number 24. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. This expression, man of God, is found 78 times in 73 different verses in the Bible. The very first occurrence of this expression is in Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 1. Do you know who it's used of? It's used of Moses. It's used of Moses. This expression, man of God, it's common in the Old Testament but only one person is called a man of God in the New Testament. That's Timothy. This expression, man of God, emphasizes humanity speaking on behalf of deity. Man of God. See, anyone who was a prophet of God was God's man. And this expression, the man of God, is used in reference to someone who represents God and who speaks the word of God on behalf of God. I say to you again tonight, I propose to you tonight that the man of God is not your enemy. The man of God has been sent into your life to show you just exactly who God is and what God wants to do in and through your life. It's unfortunate that some pastors have cloaked their malicious desires and have manipulated and controlled people with their office as pastor. 
This is not the manner in which God wants to pastor the man of God to exercise his responsibilities and authority as pastor. We are reminded of this when the Bible teaches in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 2 and 3. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. The pastor is a God-called man that must meet the biblical requirements before he can represent God and before he can speak the word of God on God's behalf. And so I say tonight, to be God's man is a high and holy calling. And woe unto the man that would use his office and his authority as pastor in a way that would bring shame and reproach to the name of Christ. I say this often. I've had some bad experiences at the dentist. Now, I appreciate Paul Thomas Sobek. He has become my friend over the years as my dentist. Well, I've had some bad experiences at the dentist. And I've also, in our hometown there, read of newspaper articles where dentists have been guilty of some very embarrassing sins. But for the health of my teeth, I don't let those people keep me from going to the dentist. I know my teeth need a visit to the dentist. And as Bible-believing people, we must not fall prey to the mindset that pastors are just money-grabbing people who delight in getting paid to yell at people and manipulate people for their own purposes. Your pastor does not want to be set on a pedestal and worshipped. Your pastor does not want to be dictator. He cannot be. My church appointed me, or I was accused of being a dictator probably 10 years ago. And so there can only be one dictator, so your pastor cannot be dictator. I'm guilty already. But your pastor does not want to be a dictator but every child of God must realize that the office of pastor does have biblical authority for oversight of the flock of God as a bishop. It is Hebrews 13 that in verse 17 in that trusted King James Bible that reads, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. As with the home, someone must be discharged with the responsibility of oversight and delegated authority to make decisions in the home. In his wisdom... God knew that born-again believers would need a place where the Word of God would be central and born-again believers could mature. And by God's design, that is the local church. Two offices of the local church, pastor and deacon. The pastor has been discharged with the oversight and the ruling authority in the church. The deacons have been discharged with the responsibility of serving at the direction of the pastor. And it is the pastor's biblical responsibility, according to 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, preach the word. And we all say amen to that. We like that be instant in season and out of season. But then the Bible says this to the preacher, the man of God. Reprove. Ouch. Rebuke. Ouch. Can I tell you, 
Reproving and rebuking does not make the pastor very popular at times. But these are his biblical responsibilities. As the man of God, we must understand that pastors are human and they make mistakes like parents make mistakes. I don't believe any parent here would follow this reason here. Well, because I have made a mistake as a parent my children should no longer look to me and listen and follow my authority. Pastors are human, and they make mistakes too. But their humanity is not an excuse to challenge their biblical authority. I propose to you this evening... That the man of God, he's not your enemy. The man of God has been sent into your life to show you just who God is and what God wants to do in and through your life. You understand the Apostle Paul, he knew what it was like for people to question his authority, for people to question his motives and credentials. And he writes to the church in that region of Galatia, he writes this very probing question, and I want you to remember it tonight. It's Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16. Paul, with a broken heart, as he has been trying to tell them what they need to hear and not necessarily what they want to hear, he asks this very heart-wrenching question in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Boy, I tell you what, every one of us ought to be excited as a member of this church that God has sent us a man of God who is filled with the Spirit of God and who proclaims the Word of God without apology. God was doing you a favor whenever he sent you a man of God. This is what we see here. Well, boy, I don't like that. Aren't you... Are you saying that your preacher, your man of God, has become your enemy just because he loves you enough to tell you the truth? Aren't we tired of politicians who just want to cater and get the votes, but they never want to shoot straight? God deliver us from a political correctness in the pulpit, and every one of us ought to say, thank God that God has been so gracious to send me a spirit-filled man of God who will tell me the truth. I don't believe a person violates any biblical principles when they show deference and respect for the office of pastor. I believe it's wise. I do not believe a person violates any biblical principles when they seek godly counsel from their pastor. I do not think a pastor has a God image when they expect people to follow their counsel when it is sought any more than you expect people to follow your counsel when they seek it from you. Boy, I went to ask the preacher, and this is what he told me. Who does he think he is, God? No. If you don't want to hear what he has to say, don't ask his advice. But he's no different than you. If I come and I ask you for advice and you give it to me, naturally you think I'm going to listen to what you just said. That doesn't mean you have a God image. Do you see it tonight? I hope you're able to see it. I think it is appropriate to honor your pastor and show him kindnesses that you might not show other individuals. Because you realize the man of God has been sent into your life to show you who God is and what God wants to do in and through your life. I don't believe there's anything wrong when we recognize an airman, a sailor, a soldier, or a marine with a medal, and we call him a hero. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. 
I remind you, Romans 13 and verse 7 teaches, honor to whom honor. To whom honor. And 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17 reads, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. As the man of God, the pastor ought to be someone that people can look up to and respect. The pastor ought to be an example to which young people can emulate. It is not man worship when people learn to admire and respect a godly pastor any more than it is man worship for a young person to wear a sports uniform with his favorite athlete's name and number on it. Here's what I'm saying tonight. Let's work at loving and supporting the man of God. There will be times when your man of God will need your forgiveness and patience because of the dumb things he might say or do. I pastored for 13 years. Dumb, dumb, dumbest. Dumb and Dumber, that's a movie about my life as a pastor. I have said and I have done some very dumb things. But I am so grateful for those patient and loving and supportive and forgiving members in our church when I've said some dumb things and when I have done some dumb things they said, Preacher, you don't have anything to worry about. It. I accept your apology, but I realize you love us. Don't you worry about that. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. May I say this also about the man of God? He's not Superman. The man of God does not get up in the morning and put on leotards that have a capital S on his chest. I know sometimes you might think that. Now hold on, get that visual out of your mind right now. You're, you're a tough crowd, I can tell that already. Your man of God is not Superman. Now let me just say this. The man of God, what do you mean by that? The man of God cannot do it alone. Okay, if we know our, our man of God is not Superman and he can't do it all alone, you know what that means then? The application there is get involved. Participate. Be faithful. Be available. If you understand that your preacher is not Superman, that means that he cannot uh, leap tall buildings. He can't do it alone. That means you need to get involved. You need to be available. You need to participate. Why? He can't do it alone. He's not Superman. I'm saying tonight, let's work at loving and supporting the man of God. Let me say this. If he makes a plea for money... There must be a need. Don't make, don't make your man of God resort to begging. Let me kind of let you inside the pastor's heart, someone who pastored. There is nothing more difficult for the preacher, for the man of God, than to get up in church and to ask for money. Because he knows folks are on a fixed income. He knows there are folks who have got laid off. He knows all of these things. And he feels very uncomfortable about doing it. But there is a need. 
And the way that God has designed that the needs of the local church be met is through the membership of the local church. And so I say to you tonight, if God has been gracious to send you a spirit-filled man of God and he comes and he says, listen, there's a need, we need some money, don't make your man of God resort to begging. Do what you can to help meet the need, but don't make him beg. And then I say this, pray for him. Pray for him. The man of God is aware and reminded of his humanity regularly. I don't know any preacher who thinks he's perfect. You want to know why? He's reminded of his imperfections all the time. And I tell you what, whenever he has a major blunder and he gets home, the first one to let him know he laid an egg or he got himself in trouble was his wife. She looks at him and he says, I know. So here's what I'm saying. People let him know all the time what he's done wrong. You know what? That's a reminder. I need to pray for my man of God. I understand he's just a man, but he is a man speaking on behalf of God. I know he has limitations. I know there are frailties about him, but that's why I need to pray for my preacher. Do you understand that according to Ephesians 4 and verse 11, he is one of Jesus' gifts to the church? In other words, the pastor is a gift from God. Wow, what a way to look at the man of God that has been sent into your life to realize this is God's gift to help me to reach my potential and allow God to work through me. I always say this when I preach this sermon. It's a parenthesis. Probably one of the most underappreciated people in a church probably one of the most overworked people in a church is the pastor's wife. I don't know how many times my wife went to bed crying and when I try to reach over to console her, it's all right. When a nursery worker doesn't show up, everybody just says, well, the pastor's wife can do that. Well, that is the pastor's wife. And you ladies, when someone criticizes or says something ill about your husband, <laughs> you just go after him, don't you? You don't know how many times the pastor's wife has her, had to listen to things, negative and critical comments about her husband. But because of her love for you, she could not defend her husband like you have that luxury. One of the most loved and cared for and appreciated people in this church ought to be the pastor's wife. Every lady ought to find out what her favorite candy bar is, what her favorite pop is, where she likes to eat, and a week ought not go by where a lady ought not write her a note and thank her genuinely and sincerely. She ought to be flooded with kindnesses like anyone, no one else receives. You don't understand the pressure. 
I won't belabor the point, but let me also say, cut, some, cut the pastor's children some slack. Will you? Well, I th man, everybody thinks my girl should have memorized the books of the Bible whenever they were born. What's taking them so long, right? Everybody thinks every pastor's kid's going to be a missionary going, living in a grass hut, or if they're a boy, they're going to be a preacher. And everyone wants to look at the pastor's kids like they're something special. They're kids just like yours. Affected by the fall just like yours. I want you to cut his children some slack like you would want someone to care for your children. I'll end it there because I know what it's like for the ministry to take a toll on your children. It was only after Elijah raised her son back to life that she realized the man of God has been sent into my life to show me just exactly who God is and what he wants to do in my life. It was only then. It is only when you have a need or a crisis that you appreciate all that your pastor does. If you've never had a crisis in your life, you don't understand the schedule that your preacher keeps. But whenever you have a need, it begins to dawn on you. Preacher, preacher, you've got to come right now. You've got to come. My husband, I don't know what's wrong. He's not responding. Preacher, please, will you come to the house? It's 2 o'clock in the morning. And the preacher throws on his trousers and he comes over and he sits with the family all night or he's been in the hospital room with you all night or he's been on the phone with you. When your preacher meets your need and your crises, you begin to realize, you know what? All of these years... I wonder who else has been calling preacher at 3 o'clock in the morning. I wonder how many other times preacher has been up all night helping someone. And then it dawns on you, wow, God's been good to give me a man of God. And notice how everything changes in the chapter here. At first, she says, you know what? You just came into my life to say, give me a drink, give me something to eat, feed me first, and then point out all of the things wrong. Then when she had a need, and God used the man of God to meet the need, notice what she says at verse 24. And the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. What a change in attitude as we come to the last verse. I believe in other words she's saying, I'm sorry, Elijah. I get it now. I realize now that you didn't come to tell me what to do. You didn't come to ask for what little I had or to point out all of my mistakes. The widow says, I guess what I'm trying to say, Elijah, is thanks for all that you do. You're a gift from God. What a change of attitude, isn't it? And maybe sometimes God has to send a crisis into your life so that God can use the man of God to be there for you to begin to understand he's not your enemy. He's your friend. I wonder who is here tonight, but you've been thinking back here and you've kind of fallen prey to this mindset and you've been almost a little vocal and critical about your man of God. 
It's easy to point out all of the things that we do wrong, but I wonder, have you ever taken time to say thank you? A note, an email, a text. It doesn't take long anymore. That goes a long way. I'm talking to some tonight. You come to church and you say, wow, talking about a man. No, we're talking about a man who talks about God. If you're here tonight, we don't come to church to worship a man. It's not about a church. It's not about a preacher. It's about the Savior, Jesus Christ. You can come to this church every day of your life, and that still does not give you a Bible promise that you will go to heaven. You could get baptized. You can give a lot of money to the church, but none of those things will gain you access into heaven. Our only hope for heaven is placing our full faith and trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross how he died, how he was buried, and how he was resurrected. There is only one perfect person that ever lived, and that is Jesus Christ. And when he died, he was not dying for his sins. He was dying for ours. What an amazing love. And so I say to you, if you are here tonight, and there's never been a time where you have seen your sin as God sees it, and you have never from a repentant heart put your full faith and trust in him, I want to encourage you to do that tonight. We're not going to ask you to join a church. We're not going to ask you to become a Baptist. We just want to have the opportunity to share the word of God privately and patiently with you like someone took time to share the word of God with us so that we could see our sin and realize the Savior is Jesus Christ. If you came tonight and you have never trusted Christ as Savior, in just a moment after I pray, the pianist is going to begin to play. And on that first note of that first stanza, I want anyone and everyone who has never accepted Christ as Savior to come down to the front. We'll have a lady share with a lady uh, from the Bible how you can be saved. We'll have a man share with a man from the Bible how you can be saved. If you're here tonight and if you were to die, do you know with Bible certainty that you would go directly to heaven or would you have some doubt? If you have some doubt, do you care enough for your eternal soul to at least investigate it? I hope that you will. For those of us who have been saved, what's your mindset? What's your attitude toward the man of God? I say tonight, thank God for the man of God. Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use the message tonight to work in hearts. If there's one here tonight who's never been saved, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, you would make them uncomfortable so they would see their need for salvation. May they come. May they trust Christ as Savior tonight. For those who call ourselves children of God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would probe deep into our hearts. Help us to see our attitude toward the gift that you have sent to us. May we get things right. May we leave dedicating ourselves to do what's right. Spirit of God, do what only you can do in this invitation we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. She's playing now. Has God spoken to your heart? Would you come? How about it, young lady? Do you know Christ as Savior? If not, would you come? Would you trust Christ tonight? We won't embarrass you. Would you come tonight? How about it, child of God? Have you found yourself kind of being questioning or maybe even critical of that one person that God has brought into your life to show you just who he is? Oh, let's get it right tonight. Let's have a change of attitude. I like the altar at a church. The altar in the Bible is a place where people die to self. The bended knee has always been the symbol of surrender and submission. When a conquering general comes and he conquers an army, you know what they do? They bend the knee. I want you to submit to his lordship tonight. Allow God to do what only God can do in your life. Oh, God can do great things in and through us, but we have to have the right attitude, the right spirit. 
Oh, that God might use you in this church to do great things for the glory of God as only He can do. Father, we bow before you now in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the preaching of the Word of God this evening. Lord, thank you for the messenger. Thank you for the message. Lord, thank you for being a good God to us who does good things. We're thankful that we're saved. We're thankful, Lord, that we're in church. Thank you, Lord, that in your plan, you established local New Testament churches that we get to be a part of. Lord, it's an honor to serve you. It's an honor to be part of the family of God. Thank you for this group. Thank you for Commonwealth Baptist College. Thank you for Clays Mill Road Baptist Church and for the men of God there, for the people of God that you've raised up there. Lord, I pray your continued blessing upon those people. And may you use them in a great way to influence another generation for Jesus Christ. Now, Father, we do pray your blessing on our fellowship together tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to enjoy the fellowship of one another and that the conversation we have over the food this evening would be pleasing in your sight. Remind us that you sit at every table and you listen in on every conversation. And I pray, Lord, that the things we say would be edifying one to another and pleasing to you. Lord, dismiss us now with your care. Lord, make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place tonight. It's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to, the, the ladies who need to serve, are they gone? Did they go? All right. Let's sing together. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Hey, girls, you can go back and get to your table. Just one second. Just one second. And uh, buy the music. Okay? This is... This is Christian music, what you heard tonight, all right? Uh, there's, you know, I'll be, yeah, I'll become your enemy because I tell you the truth, but much of what people are trying to listen to today is, is not Christian music. I'll just flat out just be honest with you, all right? And uh, this, is, this is good, godly music. Dr. Lee Robertson from Tennessee Temple in Highland Park used to say, it's distinctively Christian. And whatever you do ought to be distinctively Christian. Amen. Someone shouldn't just come in and hear the music and say, oh man, that's rock and roll, or oh man, I know what that is. No, it ought to be immediately, that's Christian music. Amen. And uh, not just Christian words, Christian music, right. okay? I won't preach another sermon, but let's, uh, this, is, this you can trust, and this is good. And you'll be so much better if you play music like this in your home instead of have the television on all the time. Uh, it'll change the atmosphere at home. Hey, it'll change the behavior of your children. Right. Yeah. If you won't have the TV on, if you'll shut it off and you'll play godly music, 
uh, it'll change you. So take advantage of that and uh, get some CDs, lighten their load, and um, th there'll still be as much weight in the van because they're going to eat ice cream tonight. But uh, well, uh, it'll be different, all right? All right, now we can sing, all right? You ready? <laughs> it's a grand thing to be a Christian. Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.